Okay, now, good. All right, let's get started. My name is John O'Donnell. Uh, good. Glad to see all of you here. I'm the Chief Knowledge Officer of Online Trading Academy. And we're going to we're gonna do something a little bit different than perhaps you've done at FX Street in the past. And that is we're going to look at gold as a currency denominator. You know, if you really think about it, um, gold is a unique currency uh, that, yes, I believe this is going to be recorded by the FX Street administration staff. So the um, gold is a currency. In fact, gold has been real money since ancient Lydia over 3,000 years ago. And as you know, there is an exchange ratio between gold as money or even silver as money. Matter of fact, silver was money before gold was. And there is an exchange ratio, and we should look at gold, in my opinion, as a currency denominator to measure valuation. Just like you can use the dollar, the yen, the euro, um, the pound, the sterling, you can use any currency, but what's unique about gold, and the reason I like to use it, is because no central bank can print gold. It's that simple. You know, it's estimated that since the gold mining industry was developed, about 13, I believe it's over about 13,700 tons of gold exist above ground today, and 20% of that gold is held in the custodianship by central banks across the world. Now, there's great debate uh, when I say custodianship, <coughs> I mean at least on their balance sheet. Whether they have the physical gold in their possession or not, it's another story. It's always been a huge debate around how much of that gold has been shorted or, or lent uh, to the mining industry or to bullion banks. But at the end of the day, gold is money. And if it wasn't money, uh, central banks would not keep it as a reserve asset against the fiat money that, that they create. I've always felt that the fiat money system, uh, that is money that is created by central banks through fractional reserve banking systems across the world, and, and virtually all money systems today are fiat money systems, distort uh, reality when it comes to measurement. You know, if you're going to measure something, you need a constant metric of measurement. Gold is my constant metric of measurement. Now, it fluctuates in price, just like any other currency fluctuates in price. There are periods of time we've had booming bull markets in gold relative to fiat money, and there are periods of time where we've had a bullion uh, bear market relative priced in a fiat currency unit. But today, what I want to do for a few minutes is take a look at gold as a benchmark of measurement of real value versus the fiat currency system. And I'm going to show you some charts today, a whole series of charts that I think you're going to find quite interesting because it gives you a totally different perception of the measurement of net value. Um, there are two hedges I guess we all need to take a hard look at. One is the impact of inflation on valuation and the impact on deflation when it comes to valuation. Now, generally speaking, and in times of inflation of the fiat money system, uh, fiat money loses purchasing power parity relative to hard goods. In times of deflation, in fact, fiat money systems gain purchasing power parity relative to hard goods. In other words, your fiat money grows in buying power. But buying power for what? Well, it could buy homes, it could buy securities, uh, it could buy equities, it could buy, might very well grow in value and, and buy bonds um, or, or labor, uh, various components. So we're going to take a hard look today. Think about measurement of distance. You know, think of a world where 12 inches were not uh, a foot, or think in measurement of time, uh, that 60, you lived in a world where 60 minutes were not an hour. You know, a BTU of energy is extremely well defined. But how do you, how do you define a dollar? How do you define a euro? 
you know, how do you define a yen? Those are fiat currency systems that are constantly changing um, in purchasing power parity because they really are not convertible into anything uh, at some a fixed exchange rate. I'll give you an example. Take a look at the on your chart right now, the uh, 20-year Treasury bond uh, fund price in grams of gold since 2008. Uh, on on the bottom scale, we can take a look at time. On the left on, on the left scale, we can take a look at price. In other words, we've seen the 20-year Treasury bond yield go from a little over 4.2 grams of gold down to today about two and a half grams of gold. So what we're going to look at today are various uh, currencies priced in various units of gold. And we're going to use, we're going to look at equity markets, housing markets, we're going to look at coffee, commodities, oil, we're even going to look at the price of labor. But instead of pricing it in dollars or euros or yen, we're going to price it in units, grams of gold. And you're going to see a totally different perspective uh, when you take the time to price goods and services. Now, where can you get this data? You can get this data by going to this website, pricedingold.com. And you might want to write this down uh, because they do a marvelous job each day of updating true prices of all kinds of goods and services uh, priced in grams of gold. Now, obviously, depending upon what country you're talking about, many of these goods and services could also be priced in fiat currencies but of, of the country of your origin. But today we're going to take a hard look at pricing of various instruments in grams of gold and use that as our denominator. Now, I've been using grams of gold as my denominator since the early 1970s. So many of these charts are more long-term in perspective, and they give you a totally different perspective of valuation when you take out uh, the distortion of the inflated current, uh, fiat currency system. So the first one we want to take a look at is uh, China. Uh, we're going to take a look at China. This is going to work. If I can, uh, there we go. That's just a little slow. That's all. Okay, here's the Chinese RMB. Uh, the Chinese yuan, as you can see, in 1990 was priced at, at almost 20 grams of gold, or excuse me, micrograms of gold. And today you can see that the Chinese currency, the yuan, is priced at about three and a half micrograms of gold. Think about that for a moment. This is the uh, Chinese RMB priced in gold. Now you know that the Chinese RMB has appreciated substantially against the U.S. dollar, but as you can see, the Chinese RMB uh, has lost tremendous amount of purchasing power relative to gold. Now let's take a look at coffee. Coffee is the most consumed beverage in the world. Let's take a look at the price of coffee priced in uh, grams of gold. This is, I'm sorry, this is coffee priced since 1994 in micrograms of gold per pound. You can see coffee peaked out in a great bull market at over 300 micrograms of gold back in 1997. And today you've seen since 1997, we have been in a significant bear market. Um, in coffee, because today it's priced at about 35 micrograms of gold, uh, a little over 30, perhaps 32. Here's another image of that same coffee uh, priced in micrograms of gold since uh, 2006. And as you can see, uh, we are, in fact, in a bear market of that particular commodity when I price it in a currency denominator other than uh, the U.S. dollar. Here's one that very well may surprise you, and this is crude oil. This is what crude oil looks like in prices of gold. 
This is the price of crude oil. Blow this up a little bit for you. This is the price of crude oil uh, going back to 1950. And this is West Texas Intermediate crude oil priced in grams of gold per barrel. Now take a hard look at this. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, it took approximately two and a half grams of gold uh, to purchase you one barrel of oil. We've seen a very volatile priced. Uh, these are two very volatile priced assets. Not only gold is the currency denominator or the measuring tool at which we're pricing barrels of oil, uh, but also the barrel of oil itself. Now, note that a barrel of oil uh, has not changed in its specific amount of BTUs of energy. And gold has really not changed. Uh, gold is an inert element. So at the end of the day, what has dramatically fluctuated here uh, relative, of course, as you all know, gold is also priced in dollars. Oil is also priced in dollars. So we're basically looking at the exchange rate. But take a look at where we are today. Today we have oil priced at approximately 1.7, uh, barrel of oil priced at approximately 1.7 uh, grams uh, of gold, a little over two. This is the New York Merck crude oil futures contract showing you that oil today down from 2008 of almost five uh, grams of gold is now priced at about two grams of gold. So in fact, we've been in a significant bear market in gold, excuse me, in oil relative uh, uh, to gold. Now everybody knows or everybody believes that college tuition has been rising exponentially. If you've had the opportunity to send your kids to college, you know that we've seen a significant rise in college tuition. What we're going to take a look at is a chart of the cost of um, tuition, room, and board at Yale College priced in grams of gold. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with Yale, it's a very uh, upscale Ivy League university in Connecticut, and if you were to price college tuition, room and board in dollars, I think all of you have a very specific image of what's dramatically happened uh, to the tuition. Matter of fact, in 1932, it cost you approximately $1,050 a year. By 2009, the cost was about $48,000 a year. But if I take a look at pricing college tuition, in grams of gold, it has a totally different picture. Take a look at this. In 1900, it took approximately 1,000 grams of gold to purchase you a year's worth of college tuition, room, and board. We saw it escalate all the way up to almost 3,500 uh, grams of gold and then collapse uh, in 1970 from 3,500 grams of gold down to 500 grams of gold. Over the last 20 years, we've seen the price of college tuition go from 500 grams of gold at Yale to over 4,000, an eight-fold increase. But look what's happened to college tuition since 2000 over the last 12 and a half years. We've seen a collapse all the way from 4,000 back down to 1,000, a little over 1,000 grams of gold. That is a totally different perceived value or perspective of what you probably have about the cost of cottage tuition, room, and board uh, priced in grams of gold using gold again as our denominator. Matter of fact, that was uh, I've got a couple of kids that just got out of college and that was extremely uh, interesting for me. Now one of the greatest uh, ratios that I've always paid a lot of attention to is the price of copper. You know, copper is usually called the metal that has a PhD in economics. In other words, there's more economic wisdom priced into the price of copper because it is such a critical element to a modern civilization. It is very sensitive to the pace, the ebb and flow of everything related to a modern economy, from electrical wiring to circuit boards, the plumbing, coins, 
creating various alloys. Uh, when the economy is growing, the price of copper is rising in dollars. When the economy is shrinking, copper is telling us in real terms that the economy is in fact shrinking. So let's take a look at copper priced in grams of gold. Now if you look at since the commodity peak in 2008, we've seen copper priced in grams per ton go from about 325 grams of gold per ton down to a little over 150 uh, grams per ton. Let's take another look that I think is quite telling is the expansion of the U.S. economy. If you use, again, gold as your currency denominator um, to price copper, you can see since the 1900, where it took about 600 grams of gold to, to purchase one ton of copper, uh, today it only takes 200 um, grams of gold to purchase one ton of copper. Now, a lot of that we can owe to the efficiency of the mining industry uh, through mechanization, autom uh, automation, the discovery of, uh, and, and the competition in, in, in the extraction of copper, recycling of copper. Uh, but you can see since 1900, look at that great bull market in copper coming out of the Great Depression in the 1930s. We saw copper go from 200 grams per ton to over 1,000 grams per ton. But look what's happened to the price of copper since 1970's peak, where it's gone from 1,000 grams down below 200, and today it's just over 200 grams per ton. That is telling you something about the global economy. This is one that uh, will surprise most of the people on Wall Street. Uh, I have been following the, what I call the Dow Gold uh, Ratio since, oh, the early 1970s. Um, and most people here today are looking at uh, over 15,000 on the Dow. Uh, we're looking at 1660 on the S&P. And everybody is talking about a new bull market. Uh, we're not, if I were to discount the Dow for inflation, we're not close to a new bull market. Let's take a look at Dow's 16-year price performance if I were to price one unit of the Dow Jones Industrial Average in grams of gold. Now this goes from January of 1997 through May of 2013. You've seen uh, the great bull market where it took approximately 1,400 grams of gold to purchase one unit of the Dow in first quarter of uh, well, fourth quarter of 1999, uh, leading into the big sell-off in the first quarter of 2000. But take a look at where we are today. Now, obviously, I'm going to show you a longer-term chart in a moment, going back to 1985. But today, uh, we're just a little over 300 grams. This reflects approximately a 75, 80% decline in the Dow. Uh, so. If I were to use gold as my denominator, or if I were to use a fiat currency, uh, it looks remarkably different. This is Dow Jones Industrial Average since 1985. And as you can see, starting in early 1982, this was the real bull market in equities that went uh, from, with, and a bear market in gold during that period of time that drove the Dow gold at ratio from under 200 to over 1400 and since 2000 we've seen nothing but a pretty serious bear market in this ratio. But what do you think this looks like if we were to go all the way back to 1900? Let's take a look at this chart. This is an incredible chart. <laughs> this is a chart on why you don't want to be a buy and hold investor. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average priced in grams of gold going back to 1900. No, way back in 1900, it took a little over 100 grams of gold to buy one unit of the Dow. This was the bull market into 1929, where it took 600 grams of gold. The crash back all the way to 100. The great bull market coming out of the 1930s, where it returns to 800. The crash 
1966 all the way back down to 1980 from 600 or excuse me 800 back down below 100 and this was that great bull market that the real bull market in equities that really started around 1982 it peaked in late 1999 and here we are today back uh, at a little over 300 ladies and gentlemen that's been quite a ride this it's been a significant ride, and for a lot of people, this is a real wake-up call. Based on purchasing power parity, using gold as my denominator, that the Dow is down, is not in a new bull market at all. In fact, it is down over 80% from, and substantially below the peak of 1929, substantially below the peak of 1966, and of course, substantially below the peak of 1999. Now, what about silver? How has it performed relative to gold? Well, that's a ratio I would assume a lot of you are interested in today because but this is the price of silver going back to 1700 This is how many grams of gold does it take to buy um, one troy ounce of silver? And you can see in the 1700s through 1850, it took about two grams of gold to buy one troy ounce of silver. Today, you can see it takes about 0.5 troy ounces of gold to buy one uh, unit of silver. Let's take a look at that since 1965. You can see that gold has been a significantly better store of value. Silver is the most price volatile of the two metals. But in fact, gold is money. Silver is money but has a major industrial component. But central banks are not holding silver as reserves. Silver banks are holding gold as reserves, as gold has been real money for over 3,000 years. In fact, silver has played a very important monetary role as well. And you can see what's happened to the silver Dow gold, excuse me, silver gold ratio uh, going back to 19, uh, 2005. Now let's talk about uh, a couple of more that are a little closer to home, which is electric power. How many grams of gold does it take to produce a, a kilowatt of electricity? This is a very interesting chart. This is 14 years of electricity prices. This is pricing one kilowatt of electricity in uh, micrograms of gold. And notice since 2000, we've seen a substantial decline in the price of, um, of a kilowatt of electricity from over 800 uh, micrograms of gold down to 200 micrograms of gold. That was a very interesting chart for me. I was quite surprised to see that rate of decline. But what about food? Uh, there are lots of ways to, tr to treat food, but this is an index uh, put out by the IMF. This is the FAO Food Price Index, uh, priced in grams of gold. And everybody talks about going to the supermarket and how expensive food is. Uh, but if I price food from roughly uh, 1995, uh, or even, even from 1990 uh, through today, you can see that food prices have declined uh, substantially. Um, what about gold stocks? Now, that's very interesting. How did gold bullion price compare to the Huey gold bug index? Well, let's take a look at this. The gold bug index has dramatically declined from uh, 20 uh, grams of gold in 2004 down to a little over 5 grams of gold today. And obviously, the gold miners uh, are trading at at or near an all-time low uh, relative to the price of bullion. And I think that's a very telling index as well. But one that I know you're probably going to be interested in, let's see if I can find it here, which is how is the gold compared to the great bull market in real estate? 
that we've all lived through, the boom bust in real estate. Now, this chart shows the Case-Shiller Home Price Index uh, in U.S. dollars, and then it's expressed in grams of gold. And we're going to take a look at a couple of indexes. Here's the first index, uh, which is the U.S. The Case-Shiller Home Index priced in U.S. dollars in blue. And this is, shows you how well that tangible asset did relative to the fiat currency. But if I price that same Case-Shiller Home Index uh, from 1987 uh, through today in red in grams of gold, you can see that it has the U.S. single-family home has not performed very well. As a matter of fact, you can buy a single-family home today uh, below um, the price you, you would pay in 1987. It's, it's retraced that entire movement from 40 to 140, from 140 in 2005, summer of 2005, all the way back down below 30 today. So this is what that Case-Shiller index looks like priced in gold. In fact, you can see that we have, in fact, have been in a bear market for a significant period of time if we were to use the uh, Case-Shiller Index. Now, this will surprise a lot of people. A lot of people have been led to believe that real estate is a great hedge against inflation. In fact, uh, relative to gold, uh, and this is the value of the Case-Shiller Index going back to 1890, and you can see how it's fluctuated from a low of 40 to a high of 160, and today it's all the way back down to 20. And so relative to gold uh, as an inflation hedge, uh, you, we could make the claim that the U.S. single-family home has not performed very well at all. But what about U.S. household net worth? How does that, what does that look like? Well, since 1945, this is the picture of U.S. household net worth from 1945 to present, priced in grams of gold. 1940, uh, take a look at this, 1945 coming out of World War II through 1970, uh, we saw the U.S. household net worth um, priced in grams of gold, excuse, excuse me, in tons of gold. This is the, this is the aggregate U.S net worth priced in tons of gold. We've seen it go from under 500 tons of gold to over 3,000 tons of gold. That's great productivity. But notice from 1970 through 1980, all that was given back. And then from 1980, we go from about 500 tons of gold to over 5,000 tons of gold. But look how the U.S. aggregate net worth has dropped since 2000. And what you can thank for that is the bear market in equities as measured by the Dow and the S&P and the bear market in the single family home. Single family home being the largest asset on the balance sheet of the average American family. It's a very alarming chart when you think about it. Uh, but you can see the average American home uh, net worth has been quite volatile. Now, what about the S&P 500? Well, the S&P 500 is not going to look much different uh, than the Dow Jones Industrial Average, although since it's a much larger index, this is the S&P 500 priced in grams of gold going back to the 1880s, um, which I find quite remarkable. This is the crash of the 1930s, the great bull market coming out of the 1930s into 1970. The crash from roughly 1970 into 1980, the great bull market in equities coming out of 1980 into the peak of 2000, and of course the big decline uh, in the S&P relative to gold uh, as uh, to where we are today. What about the Nikkei index? I'm sure we've got a lot of people here that are interested in Japanese equities. You're hearing some great news recently about the great bull market. But let's take a look at the Japanese index since 1985. The Nikkei 225 index priced in grams of gold has had a remarkable run. Very volatile price during this period of time. Their market 
really peaked significantly going back to 1989. We also had a blow-off peak into 2000. But take a look at what's happened to the Nikkei index. And they've done 10 periods of quantitative easing. Price in grams of gold, it is still at an all-time low, even though we've had this nice little rally uh, over the last couple of months. And that's not a very pretty picture if you're living in Japan. Let's take a look at a couple more. How about the U.S. dollar index? As you know, the U.S. dollar index, symbol DXY, is a proxy basket of fiat currencies. So basically, it's a fiat currency basket. This is the U.S. dollar since 1787, priced in micrograms of gold. And as you can see, it's been, it's lost probably 96% of its purchasing power parity. And this is what it's looked like, priced in micrograms of gold since 1997. This is what it's looked like since 1900. These are massive devaluations of the currency, uh, of not only its convertibility, but this shows you the destruction of the fiat currency world created by the central banking fractional reserve banking system, and this is what's happened to the U.S. dollar uh, just since, 19, since 2006. So it's not a very pretty picture. What about U.S. wages? How's the labor market perform during this period of time? U.S. wages looks just like this. U.S. wages from 1965 have gone from three grams of gold um, for a production worker down to point less than 0.5 grams per hour of wages of a production worker. What about minimum wage priced in grams of gold since 1930? From 1930, coming out of the Great Depression, we saw an escalating minimum wage law go all the way to 1.4 grams. Today, it's below 0.2 grams. So I would say for the last 43 years, we not only have seen no rise in purchasing power of wages, but in fact, we've seen massive deflation in wages um, across America. That's not a pretty picture for more economic growth. And what about U.S. disposable income? How has U.S. disposable income grown? This is kind of an alarming picture. This is U.S. per capita disposable income since 1947. This is when we started keeping records. We've seen U.S. per capita disposable income go from 1,000 to 3,000 from 1945 through 1970. Then it collapsed in 1970, going from 3,000 down to 500. The bull market coming out of the 1980s into 2000 gave rise to disposable income to go from 500 to 3,000. And since 2000, we've seen nothing but a collapse in disposable income and we're nearing the old lows that we saw in 1980. That's not a productive picture for continuing growth. If I were to price disposable income, however, in fiat money, I see that it's rising in fiat money, uh, but the problem with all of that is it's inflation. It's not real productivity growth, but if I price it in gold that no central bank can print, I see that since 1945, we've seen a substantial decline in U.S. per capita disposable income. So that becomes a headwind for the growth of our economy going forward. What about, here's a very uh, interesting, um, how about wheat? Let's take a look at wheat. Wheat prices. Wheat prices have collapsed. This is U.S. farm wheat prices in grams of gold per bushel. 
you've seen a dramatic, you can account for this plant genetics, you can account for automation, you can account for massive increase in productivity of the American farmer to produce uh, wheat, and you can see that the price of wheat has dramatically declined when priced in grams of gold, uh, and you can see how it's fluctuated going all the way back to the 1980s. So the price of wheat today is substantially lower. There's a lot of reasons for that. Cost of capital, cost of labor, mechanization, genetics, import-export, just a massive efficiency. Here's a great indicator I've always paid attention to, which is the price of postage. Yes, everything is given on the website. So all you have to do is go to this website. If you want to review this, just go to PricedInGold.com, and you can see uh, all this data uh, at your leisure. Let's take a look at the price of postage. You can see that the price of postage has been rising in pink in uh, fiat money, but look what's happened to the price of first-class postage and fluctuating uh, if I were to price it in uh, units of gold, you can see that it's, it's uh, declined substantially uh, from 60 units down to 10 units from 1970 through where we are today. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that kind of, uh, oh, what about gasoline? Um, gasoline's very interesting uh, to me. Uh, this is the price of gallon gasoline in micrograms of gold. Everybody complains about the price of petroleum, but in fact, the price of petroleum today is much lower than it was in 1995. And um, there's a lot of components that go into the manufacture of gallon gasoline, including labor, distribution, uh, regulatory uh, burdens, etc. But at the end of the day, the price of gasoline is not very expensive at all. Speaking of the price of gasoline, and I'll end on this little story with my son. Uh, my son and I, the other day, were talking about the minimum wage. The minimum wage is approximately $7.50 an hour in the United States. And when I was my son's, and he was, he was complaining about the purchasing power um, of, um, of, of $7.50 and how many gallons of gasoline he would buy me. And I told my son when I was a kid, uh, minimum wage was a dollar and a quarter an hour, but a gallon of gasoline was 25 cents, which means uh, I could buy five gallons of gasoline for one unit of minimum wage. Minimum wage was a buck and a quarter. Uh, there are five quarters uh, that would buy me five gallons of gasoline. And I said, how many gallons of gasoline can you buy today for $3.50? And he can buy a little over two gallons of gasoline. And in other words, um, the purchasing power of the currency has dramatically been lost. But when I was a kid, my dollar and a quarter, my five quarters, were backed with silver. And each one dollar face value of silver, or four quarters, um, would uh, has 0. 0.72 ounces of silver, 900 fine silver coins. So if I were to take, uh, let's see, 0. 0.72 times, say, $22 silver, that means each $1 face value of silver coins has about 15, almost $16 worth of fiat, uh, fiat monies worth of silver. And $16 today... Let's see, divided by $3.50 a gallon where I live will buy me about four and a half gallons of gasoline. So I said, in fact, if I were paid the minimum wage in a hard currency back with silver, not a fiat currency, uh, my unit of labor uh, back in the mid-60s has more buying power than his unit of labor today. That was a, that was a tough economic lesson for a lot of people to comprehend. But in fact, that is the reality of inflation, and that is the reality and the reason we need to put pressure to return to a currency that's backed with something tangible so we can truly understand the purchasing power parity 
of the fiat currency world versus the honest money movement world. Now, if you would like more information on this topic, I'd like you to go to Amazon. Actually, I think you can get a, a free copy of this. Go to Google and type in the search for a book. It's in PDF form, free on Google, and the title is What Has Government Done to Our Money by Murray Rothbard. So that title is What Has Government Done to Our Money. It's a free book. It's in PDF form. You can also buy it on Amazon.com if you want. The professor who wrote it in the late 60s was my mentor. His name is Murray Rothbard, and I encourage you to get that book and read it if you want more information on this topic and the importance of having honest money. Ladies and gentlemen, the fiat currency world is not an honest money system. It's happening all over the world. It's happening in Europe, it's happening in Asia, it's happening in America. And I believe it is time that we return to an honest money system. God bless you all. Good luck. My name is John O'Donnell. I'm with Online Trading Academy. We have lots of free information at our website, tradingacademy.com. As a matter of fact, for those, uh, I'm going to be giving a free seminar today at 5 p.m., and all you need to do is go to our website to sign up for it. We're going to be talking about supply and demand using our model to find high probability turning points in markets. God bless you all. Good luck, and I hope all your trades are green in 2013. Bye-bye.